Hi, my name is Caldwin. Thank you for watching this video. Please stick around to the end of the video to see the prayer points we're going to do as far as what this video is about. But in this book right here, The Strongs, which is made to translate Greek and Hebrew to English, the word Laodicea, Laodicea means people justice, people do the justice, people govern, people are the rule makers, and essentially the people are gods. And that is what this video is about. It is about, about the Church of Laodicea, the People's Church. But about two and a half years ago, a person read to me these scriptures and said, this is what you need to be doing. And he started in verse 17 of Acts 26 and said, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's Jesus speaking because it's in red. So as I make this video, this is about salvation. This is about all the things that Jesus Christ was concerned about. And a church that's too concerned about what they want can't at the same time be concerned about what Jesus Christ says that they need. That's what this video is about. First things first, I want you guys to know I do this video out of an extreme burden, not a necessary desire for thousands of people to see this. If thousands of people see this, my goal is for those people to hear it and believe, not for them to simply hear it and give views and likes. That doesn't matter enough to me for me to even spend time doing this 415 times. I didn't do that many times. But I want you to know, I've tried to make this video in many different ways on many different processes many different occasions i've spoken on this whiteboard i've spoken on the desk out there i've tried to record it in random places the message is very simple but it can be very complicated to present it to people and i do believe that the power is in the bible as it was for me so it should be the same for everybody else so that being said why not you know go to the bible and see what the lord has to say today hope you guys are having a wonderful day my days are joyous. But there is a burden. There is an issue. And you know, not every Christian just gets to happily go by every single day as if nothing bad has ever happened. And especially once you start to grasp and understand what's really going on spiritually in this world today. And as I studied that, I realized that this is what my pastor in the Bible has called the depths of Satan. And I had to just come out and just pull out of the study and, you know, just leave that alone. That being said, there are hundreds, if not thousands at this point, of videos on YouTube explaining to you today what I studied and why it's true and why it doesn't line up with the Bible. And that being said, I don't want this to be another video where I just show you, hey, look, this is what happens in churches, including my church that I went to, and this is what the Bible actually says should be happening, right? Those videos are out there. They're not false. Some of them can come from people who are, you know, a little bit bitter. You know, I went to these churches. I came out of these churches, so I know what it's like to walk with these people for 26 years. If I, if I say this, I say this out of experience. I say this out of love. I say this out of concern. I say this out of burden. I want you to, if it needs to happen, explore this truth. And I don't need you to stay on YouTube your whole life because that's not my goal either. I want you to explore whether or not this is true for yourself and question it for yourself. I don't want you to have to go through the amount of research I did for you to realize it's not biblical. I don't want you to have to do all the things that I did and see all the things that I've seen and study all the things that I've studied to know that it's not biblical. I made charts, I made graphs, I attached scripture to the truth and find out that Jesus was telling us these things for our concern, not just because Jesus is an overbearing monster and wants us to have no joy whatsoever. That's a lie from the pits of hell. That being said, Jesus commands us many things in his gospels. I noticed a lot of it was in the book of Matthew, but he commands us a lot of things to protect us from the falsity that is out there. You got Matthew chapter 11 and 12. You got Matthew chapter 7 especially. You got so many things where Jesus is commanding you not to do the things that people in churches today are absolutely doing and are unaware of it. People are genuinely unaware of what's happening. So what I decided to do in the beginning of this time was to study what I would call the, you know, the concept of slap Jesus on it, right? Now I find out that that's actually already a biblical concept, and it's in the Laodicean church. It is in Matthew, all throughout Matthew, where people draw nigh unto God with their lips and honor him with their mouths, but their heart is far from him. 
That being said, I don't know where the person watching this video stands regarding that, but I just, I'm, I'm going to pray for the Lord for, for some wisdom about communicating this first. Lord, I'm asking you today, in the name of Jesus, that you would soften the hearts of those watching this, soften their hearts and their minds and their ears and make them ready to hear it. And as I try to portray and, com and communicate this message, Lord, I'm praying that this would be one that was clearly understood. And I pray that my heart is shown and the study is as clear as possible, even despite the heavy amounts of evidence that other videos have. I pray that this is an effective way and a different way of communicating the importance of your gospel and what you say in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Mind you, I've recorded this specific part probably like 20 different times. Verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I read that passage, I don't know how many times, but the more I read it, the more I realize how important this is. Jesus is commanding people who have somehow found their way into a church that doesn't have him in it, that it is time to be zealous and repent. It's a time to grab a hold of the true meaning of salvation and the doctrine of salvation. All the things that he said about being wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked are spiritual. These people are not completely clothless. They are not physically blind. They don't. It's not that they have no money. It's not that they are, you know, wretched in a physical sense or miserable in a physical sense. It's because they're spiritually miserable, wretched, poor, blind, and naked. And they don't have spiritual eyes. They are spiritually exposed. Think about this. When he said the words naked and the shame of thy nakedness appearing, the first thing that came into my mind is Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, which God told them not to do, and the shame immediately came over, and they knew that they were exposed, and they knew that they were naked, they knew that they sinned against God, and that brought shame. Now that being said, he says, be zealous therefore and repent. Now, I know this for a spiritual fact, and no matter how many times people tell me they don't see it, I see it. The spirit that is working in churches today is teaching the opposite of the gospel, By the way, let's go ahead and get rid of this part while we're at it. If I can talk to you about the gospel and not use the cross and not use the sins in the conversation and I not use the scriptures in the conversation, I can keep you blind while thinking you're the most spiritual person on the planet for loving the gospel. Because it's not the whole gospel. It's not the full gospel. Because you don't know about your sins being the problem. They crucified Jesus Christ. But if I can blind you from that, I can add a bunch of other doctrines to make you believe it the opposite of the Bible. But the Bible says that I'm righteous and I can't be righteous and be a sinner at the same time. And teaching directly against repentance. If we saw at the end is be zealous therefore and repent, right? So what does the false church teach you to do? Outside of the church, there's no zeal for Christ, right? But also inside of the church, right? What are they teaching you? They're teaching you the exact opposite of biblical repentance. They're teaching you either to repeat after me this prayer or your sins aren't worried. Don't worry about them. Just follow the Ten Commandments. Follow the Torah. Your obedience is what's going to justify you. Let's see how many false doctrines we can get rid of just with this, by the way. Just pay for your sins. Give the money to the preacher. You know, go work and knock on doors to, uh, to justify yourself in the eyes of God. There's millions and millions of different false doctrines out there that all just center away from the simple idea of repentance. And all you have to do to repentance or to repent is to see our sins as a problem and need Jesus Christ's blood atonement on the cross as a solution. So in every single false doctrine in the world today, in some way, shape, or form, they're slowly but surely, first of all, not telling you the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also they're making sure that you don't reach 
biblical repentance. You don't see in your heart, man, I don't want to sin anymore. You don't see in your heart, man, I can't stand living unholy. I can't stand feeling unholy in the eyes of a holy and sinless God. Jesus Christ walked on this earth completely without sin. Not a single sin was done in his life. But if I can teach you away from this, no matter what I do, even if I have to call you a God, even if I have to call you a God kind, even if I have to blame it on the spirit of lust, the spirit of envy, the spirit of anger, the spirit of violence, I can blame those things as well. I can blame generational curses. I can put those things out there, right? It doesn't matter what religion it is. The exact same work of the devil is to take you away from repentance because guess what? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance and repentance to salvation. And guess what? Salvation is something not to be repented of. And we have salvation when we repent and believe the gospel. But guess what? If we don't have repentance, we do not have salvation. If you get rid of repentance and if you get rid of that right there, all you have is mysticism, right? Because here's the fun part. Repentance shows that sin is the problem in the world. And if sin is the problem in the world, the Jesus Christ of the Bible is the solution. Guess what? Because the Bible exposes the sin as the problem. So if I take away sin as the problem, I take away the Jesus Christ of the Bible as the solution, and I can give you some other Jesus Christ. I can give you whatever other Jesus Christ I want. He can be all the way over here, and you have to come all the way over here. And guess what? By the time you get there, Jesus Christ is going to move right down here. And then guess what? When you go over there, Jesus Christ is moving over here before you even get there. You know why? Because you're ever learning and never able to come under the knowledge of the truth. Truth is sin is the problem. And guess what? Jesus Christ is the solution because guess what? Christ died on the cross for our sins. And our sins are what separate us from God. This does not mean, let me just try my best to not do this, but all of a sudden be blind to this. No, this means your only solution to these sins is the Jesus Christ of the Bible. And it is not Jesus Christ of the Bible plus prayers, Jesus Christ of the Bible plus backflips, it's not Jesus Christ plus this. No, him and him alone shed his blood for our sins. And if they can keep you chasing after some form of Jesus Christ, some thing, some breakthrough, some release, some abundance, some life, some power that can make you think that at some point if I grab that, that'll be the thing that makes me feel spiritual rest. They can keep you strung along, ever learning, and never able to come under the knowledge of the truth. Learning in circles, God in this Jesus Christ. Because guess what the fun part is, right? Nobody likes conviction, and we seem to dodge it. I have two or three or four different examples of when I was in this little loop right here, someone came up to me to the Bible and said, hey, look, Jesus Christ died for your sins, you're a sinner, you know that? And I sat there and rejected them. And that's what this spirit does. This spirit causes you to reject the spirit of God. You know why? Because in all three manifestations, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the Bible, the first thing a sinner feels when they come in the presence of God is a need for repentance or a rejection of Jesus Christ one or the other and guess what i've rejected him before but now i have felt the spiritual repentance and the need for repentance and guess what that happens in here before it comes out of your mouth if it doesn't happen in here this means nothing people are telling me today that you know the gospel doesn't need repentance you don't need to repent to get saved you don't even need that you don't even need to address your sin the problem with that is the very first words that came out of jesus's mouth in mark chapter one were repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand the kingdom of God so I don't know where people get this but it was not from Jesus Christ and he says repent in that scripture for a reason it's because that means a change of mind and countless times I went through this and you know I wrote down what teaching that the world is teaching you today that points you away from biblical repentance and towards pride and you know exaltation and all this stuff and my studies led to me finding out that there's another spirit pretending to be the spirit of God that is teaching you the exact opposite of the Bible, but doing so with Christianese language. And my goal is to just point people strictly towards the scripture and say, hey, look, he wants the zeal of those who are in Christ. He wants you guys to, to want him and to seek him. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. He also says those that are carnal in the flesh will not please God. 
And I want to please God, and that's why I go to church. I don't go to church to get exalted. I know that at this point in time, I am imperfect, I am a sinner, and I need God's grace to get to heaven. And I wanted to do this video in a more gracious sense than the way I was doing it before because I was just sitting here. I've got this like chart right here. You see this? It's talk about the cycle of the Paul's church. I went through everything that's psychological and spiritual and manipulative about the church. But I feel like instead of exposing what's happening in the church, I should expose what's happening, what happened in me and how it relates to the Bible and that truth and why I want every person who sees this, whether you were in a false church or not, to come out of that manipulation. But I just want my body moving. I, I, it was um, incontrollable, like I couldn't control it, it was just involuntary movement and um, nothing that was, I, I think it was just more strange than anything right? because I didn't have control over it. Lord, give this young girl the Holy Spirit right now. When God says yes, nobody can say no. You Jesus. see, your destiny demands you to take different decisions. Come. Jesus. I am seeing this woman seated. She's called to be great. Ah. Did you hear me? Never allow anybody that will be a downfall of your life. Because you are gifted. You are a dreamer. Don't tell anybody your dreams. Because the moment you begin to tell your family members, they will want you to be initiated. I didn't experience that. I wanted to know what they were feeling in that moment. Come here, sister. Come in. Lift the hands. God's raising you up. Take it. The fire. The fire. Take it. Take it. Come, Holy Spirit. Come in. We just thank you, God. Go, go, go. To the truth now the bible is you know is pretty adamant and it's pretty specific that's why it's got 31,102 scriptures and that being said once you once you get from genesis to revelation you realize there's one true message and it is repentance and you see it right there in revelation chapter 3 in genesis maybe chapter 4 maybe even chapter 3 the thing that jesus or the lord wants them to do is repent and to not desire their sin but desire him his holiness his goodness his peace his love his joy is more important than any sin you can think of in your mind now that being said speaking of the mind before we ever even get to things where you know our hands start to work things that are sinful and before we even get to the part where we were already lashing out against per se our friends or our parents and have wrath it's already in our heart that sin is already in our heart and we have a scripture where it talks about taking captive the mind and the imagination and whatnot and that's because we are already in sin and we need to we need to repent before it ever comes out of our hands that being said there is a scripture in second timothy chapter three where it talks about people who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof now before i get to the next scripture in that passage romans chapter one verse 16 says i am not ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ 
for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth, both to the Jew and to the Greek also. So in, say, just for example, a Christian church, if people have been justified by somebody else because they perchance said a prayer instead of actually just, you know, realizing, hey, look, my sin was nailed to that cross 20-something years or 2,000 years ago. But if I get justified by the preacher, now I'm in, I'm in this cycle right here that I was just showing you guys. I'm in this manipulative cycle because I'm relying on them for justification, for faith, for, for doctrine, instead of relying on the Bible, which confirmed to me what happened 2,000 years ago on the cross. That is my whole concern. And that is how people get manipulated. That's how people end up in a doctrine of losing salvation and all that stuff. It's because it's because the justification didn't come from faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It came from a repetition of a prayer, which is a work. And as much as I could go into the details of that doctrinally, the Bible says in the next scriptures, for of such are they which creep into women's houses laden with sins, and they manipulate them and they hold them captive ever learning and never able to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, how do they do the, how do they creep into women's houses? First Timothy says, now the spirit speaketh expressly, that this is adamant, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. This is a crystal ball. Let's pretend this is a crystal ball, right? It's plastic, but this is a crystal ball. And the way I would manipulate you into believing that this is true and we're about to do something that's going to change your life is I'll play some magical music. Well, one might wonder how a tremendous tool for indoctrination that operates in myriad and subtle ways and will be carried with us for the rest of our lives can be only music. But leaving that alone, these types of observations by both musicians and people who work in and around the industry leave little doubt as to music's incredible power over its audience would seduce you into believing whatever doctrine I'm about to teach you. Now that being said, there is many things that people do with music, with whatever, with repetition to manipulate you. And it burdens me to study this now to realize how true this is and was true for me as well. It is, it is Eastern meditation, it's Eastern mysticism and all those things. All the things that you hear people who are, you know, who are preachers wearing the ties and the suit and all that stuff, all the things you hear them saying is actually true. And I'm saying this having gone to those churches, having been one of the black people in these black churches that were super duper proud to be in a black church, super duper proud to be in whatever church it was that had this tongue talking and this back, back flipping and whatnot. But here's the issue. The one thing that has people stringing along, right? Because people keep people coming back for more and they feel like the, the church didn't fill them up enough. That one thing that is being dangled at your neck and you feel like you, know, you have to get a hold of it and it's not there is repentance. Sometimes you can hear the whole gospel, but something else that they taught you blinds you from the gospel. And by scripture, the only person who's intended to blind you of the gospel, the one whose goal is to blind you is Satan. And the Bible says, you know, if the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And it says the Satan spirit is in them blinding them. So how did he creep in? The seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. Now, I don't want to get into how Eastern meditation works and all those weird Indian names for all the spirits that people conjure up when they speak in tongues or whatever. But I want to tell you for a spiritual fact that if you feel like you're, you're talking to a wall when you pray, it's because the need is for repentance. The need is for a broken spirit and a contrite heart. God is saying, you need to meet me where I am in, in holiness. And the only way you can meet him in holiness is if you go to the cross and say, all right, my sins are what nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. Me specifically, my pride, my lust, my lasciviousness, my, my murder, my strife, my envy, wrath, whatever it is that you specifically have, if I can't reach Jesus Christ, it's because I want those things more than I want God. And when we repent, Jesus Christ has nailed those things on the cross, and he is now our bridge to talk to the Father about whatever we need to pray about. And I know this for a fact, that so many different doctrines and religions and whatnot have built up beliefs and fallacies about what spirits can reach, your, reach the Lord with their prayers for you. It's Mother Mary, it's the, 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 the Krishna, or whatever spirits are out there, all are created to blind us from the idea that sin separates from God. And sin does separate from God. I remembered hearing the first time 
or preaching about how my love of the world was not the love of the Father because I wanted all these things that were worldly and were created. And I want you to think about this. If I don't present to you the simple idea that sin in this world is a problem, then I, then I can teach you a different Jesus Christ as a different solution to that other problem. If, if I come to you today and say some of you were oppressed and were in really bad work conditions and you know this, all of a sudden, it's not sin that's the issue. It's the workplace. I'm blaming my coworkers. I'm blaming whatever. Some of you had some really religious parents that wanted to enforce rules on you. All of a sudden, Jesus Christ is not here to save us from sin. He's here to save us from oppression and oppressive parents. And that's what's happening in the Laodicean church. That's what's happening in the people's church. And the more that begins to be the preaching of the day, the less people have the real Jesus Christ as a real solution. And I'm seeing so many people today who are Christian, but are lost. So many people today who have the tagline, who have the nice shirts, who have the cross around their neck, who've got all the cross jewelry they possibly can have, you know, a thorn crown anywhere on their logos. But the issue is they don't know that their sin and the sin of the world is the problem. So they don't know Christ is the solution. If this world had zero sin, it would be perfect that there would be no there would be no rich man taking over the world there would be no oppression there would be no there would be no rape there would be no more immigrant problems or whatever on the border people complaining about so much there would be none of this none of this but people don't know that's the issue and therefore they don't know that that's the solution that jesus christ came to gave came to give the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1.15, For this is a good and faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. Mark 2.17, The whole don't need a physician, but those that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. And all throughout the Bible, he says, you know, nation of Israel, turn from your wicked ways. 2 Kings 17, and I believe 13, says, you know, the Lord spoke unto all the fathers of Israel through the prophets talking to their fathers, saying that they should turn from their wicked ways and keep the commandments and, and all the statutes that the Lord has commanded them to keep. Turn from your wicked ways. And in Hebrews, it even mentions in chapter 1 that God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake unto the fathers and in these last times hath spoken unto us through Jesus Christ, his son. So they all preached the same message. And we all need to get the same message that this world is only the way it is because of sin. And my burden, like it burns my heart. Like I tried to do this video like countless times. Like I promise you there is footage of every time I go to this whiteboard and went and did something else and made a different chart and different graph. That was an hour probably plus worth of footage. So I've been burdened to do this. It's so long and I just wanted to talk to you guys like a normal human, like me and you, to see what the issue is and to, ex to explain to you what the issue is because you shouldn't feel like you have to come to church because you know, every single time you're empty and you need to get filled up or whatever, the desire for God should always be there. And in too many Christian conversations, I've had conversations with people where they're about like five minutes into the Jesus conversation and now they've had enough, now they wanna go back to watch Sports Center. Now they wanna go back to you know parties, they wanna go back to whatever, but they're Christian, right? That's not the case. The Holy Spirit points toward the cross. And there's too many times where I hear the Holy Spirit in people's mouths saying, like, you know, God is saying to you today that you're perfect. You're a perfect person. And if they're perfect, why did Jesus Christ die on the cross for their sins? If I am a God kind, as Joyce Meyer has said countless times. And, you know, I was listening to a set of tapes by one man, and he explained it like this, and I think this kind of gets the point across. He said, you know, why do people have such a fit about God calling his creation, his creation, his man, not his whole creation, but his man, little gods. If he's God, what's he going to call them but the God kind? I mean, if you as a human being have a baby, you call it a human kind. If, if cattle has another cattle, they call it cattle kind. So, I mean, what's God supposed to call us? Doesn't the Bible say we're created in his image? Then why did Jesus Christ die on the cross for my sins? If all I need to do is obey the Ten Commandments and obey the Torah, then why did Jesus Christ die on the cross for my sins? If I am just suffering from generational curses, then why did Jesus Christ die on the cross for my sins? If it is just the spirit of lust or the spirit of whatever, then why did Jesus Christ
Jesus Christ need to die on the cross for my sins? This is what I'm saying, is this spirit that people are preaching with is pointing directly the opposite of the gospel. And then here's the fun part, right? When they come to the gospel itself, Christ didn't die for our sins. Christ died for me. This is the biggest burden. And if we can get a hold of what the gospel truly means, then I won't have to make this video. I won't have to show you all the Eastern meditation that's happening in churches. I won't have to run through countless pieces of footage and run through all that. Like, I won't have to do any of it. And I won't have to show you all that foolishness and how long it took me to do all of it. It would just be simple enough to just say, repentance is part of the gospel. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. And I like reading the gospel. I, I, I love this, actually, because... This was this is part of understanding how you're saved, and this is how you're saved. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. If you're a Christian, you don't stand in the sinner's prayer, you don't stand in speaking in tongues, you don't stand in going to church, you stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Believing in vain means believing in all those other things instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is how we know we're saved. If we take a moment to pray, to confess our sins to the Lord, and just, just be honest, you know, okay, yes, I did this, you know. I, I slept with these women, I shouldn't have done that, I drank this, and you know, I got drunk, I shouldn't have done all of that. It's a simple process, but sometimes human beings overcomplicate things, just like I overcomplicated making this video. And when we do so, we do so and cause ourselves more anguish, more, more problems, because we just need a simple repentance, and that is our way to salvation. And Jesus Christ is waiting there right at the door, and says, if you meet me here, with a contrite heart and a broken spirit, and are ready for salvation, I am right here ready to save you. But if not, and you want some other form of Jesus Christ, don't repent and get into all that weird stuff and chase this weird dangled goal, move the goalpost every week that you never reach. The Bible says hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of a man are never satisfied. If you live in this man-created doctrine and these religions, it doesn't matter whether they're trying to get you to dress up and keep your hair down or whether they want you to obey the Ten Commandments or whether they just want you to keep praising, keep praying, keep giving, and keep attending. Either way, it's a religious cycle. Either way, it's got people trapped. Either way, people are believing in their works rather than believing in the gospel. It doesn't matter how free it looks. It's manipulation. That was the point of this whole video. That was the three hours of footage. That was all these studies. That was all these scriptures. And that was every single thing. If we can get past that and get to repentance and believe in the gospel, that sins are the problem and Christ is the solution, all of that doesn't even need to make, doesn't, it doesn't matter. And that was my heart and that is my burden my desire is for everybody to hear this and not to curse me out in the comment section or on Facebook or whatever, but to just trust that I didn't do this for me. I did this for people who will see this. Now, I want you to consider these prayer points as we wrap up this video because it's always, it's always an easy thing to call out the false preachers. But we need to get to this point where we're considering the fact that before every soul and any soul dies, as long as they are living and they have been breathing and they have blood cells moving in their body, they are able to be saved and come unto repentance and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, that being said, here are prayer points I wrote down because one of those things is exactly that. But I want us to also consider this. We should pray for our own lukewarmness and that we don't end up lukewarm. Somebody who's, you know, indifferent to the idea of salvation, spreading the gospel, caring about lost souls, because eternity is a long time. Eternity lasts longer than the forever you're thinking of. And our lukewarmness can deter us from working for the Lord and making sure somebody else hears the gospel, believes the words you're giving them from the Bible, and gets saved. So also, I want you to pray for those who have a conscience that may be seared, or maybe it's us, or maybe it's somebody else we know. Because regarding these teachers that we may hear of or know of, that maybe somebody comes to mind when you watch this video, regarding them, the example they give in Second Peter refers to one who's heard the way out who's gotten the, the gospel, who's gotten the truth. And when they did hear so, instead of going to the gospel and repenting and believing the gospel for themselves specifically, they decide like a dog to return to their own vomit. And that is what's like when a person can go from a hard heart to a harder heart after they've heard the gospel and it doesn't take its effect on them. 
And so we need to pray for those people that our conscience be not seared and their conscience be not seared. And we'll get to the next prayer point regarding that. But the thing is, when these people who have been seared are, they are doing something that they are knowing is wrong. But there are also people who are in the ministry with them or doing whatever. This is not just referring to them that are unaware of what they're doing. Like, you know, for example, a mason in the lower levels doesn't know exactly what they're getting into until they reach a certain point where they have to make a decision. Hey, look, I'm going to be honest. As a person who experienced this, I know I'm going to get deep into deep into ministry, right? And maybe this wasn't, this, this was not what God wanted me to be. But it took me diligently seeking him for him to reveal who he truly was to me and say, hey, look, this isn't that. And my prayer is that God reveals this truth to the blind who are in these places and these ministries, possibly seeking God, seeking to please him. Because if we're seeking to please him as if it's going to justify and validate us, it's going in about it the wrong way because our faith is what justifies us. But my prayer is that God reveals this truth to the blind and that you're praying for that regarding whomever you know of that may be in his ministries as well. Because it's not fun being manipulated, especially spiritually, especially when it comes to forever. And I also pray that as Revelation 18 says that we would come out from among her and, you know, be not a partaker of their evil deeds because these churches, these doctrines, these places that all have people in the endless cycle, as the conscience is seared, they're not caring whether or not their teachings are bringing you to the pits of hell because it's about the prophet. Like Second Peter talks all about it. It's about making merchandise out of people. It talks about the prophet. It talks about what they can get. Their clouds without water and their wells that run dry. Brute beasts is what it says in the book of Jude. And so come out from among her is because you're being led by somebody who does not care about your soul's well-being, even if they care about you as a physical person. They care about whether or not you've got broccoli on your plate. Your soul does not matter enough to them because their relationship with the true and living God, as it's been exposed to them, does not matter. Because it does not, you don't get a fake experience with God and get a conscience seared by just, you know, deciding I'm just going to do whatever. That has to do with rejection of the Lord God, as it says in the book of Romans chapter 1. It has to do with when you see who God really is, you stick up your hand and say, I want this instead. So that's my prayer, is that we would also desire for them to be granted repentance and have a soft and heart to hear the gospel. If they don't have a soft heart, you could give them the gospel all they want. That's literally casting your pearls before the swine, giving that which is holy unto the dogs. So my prayer is that the Lord would harden, or I should say soften their hard hearts, that they would be ready and receptive to hear the gospel when you're ready to give it right to them, and they're ready to repent and believe the gospel. Because I don't want to see anybody that I grew up with or anybody in these areas or anybody in general in a lost state or in a hardened state where their conscience is seared, where they are of a reprobate mind. Find the terminology. I don't desire that, but I see it happening already and I've seen it happen already. So my last prayer is this, what should be all of our prayers is to live repentance that therefore we can be a light to others. If you're not a repentant Christian, they're not seeing the light of Jesus Christ in you because you have not identified sin as a problem and holiness, the holiness of Christ, the righteousness of Christ in you as a solution. Therefore, we need to live repentance every single day. I don't want to touch that anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not a part of that anymore. I'm not a part of that church anymore. I'm not a part of that sin anymore. I'm not a part of those evil deeds anymore because I've come out from them and I've been separate. The Lord will separate his own from the world because he is not of the world and the world does not hear us because the world only hears its own. So we need to come out from things that are worldly and we need to live repentance as a light. How can you be a light if you're being dimmed by the darkness all around you? Salt that lost its savor. You know, children of the day that are walking in the night. We don't do that. Repentance is as a light to others and a light that is given to us from Jesus Christ. The candle set on the hill and not, you know, just covered. So these are my prayer points that I want us all to take with us and continue to pray about them and continue to work towards these things, work towards living repentance, work towards trying to soften the hearts of, you know, yourself and others through prayer and giving the word, all of these things. Let us not be lukewarm because the time is coming. The time is coming. And this is my prayer and I'm praying that you guys have a great day.